Good afternoon. Uh, appreciate everybody tuning in for Wednesday's Bible class. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get into our Bible study. If, if you've been following along over the last several weeks, uh, you'll know that kind of what we've been talking about is just life and living life a, in a way that uh, is worth it, in a way that when we get to the end of our lives, we can look back and, and rejoice by the type of life that we've lived. And what we're going to do today is we're going to study kind of the longer passage. And so there's going to be a lot of things that we don't have necessarily time to to discuss in great detail. But I I want you to see the structure of what Paul is doing with this passage. And I want you to see some of the things that that he says. The passage we're going to be studying is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32. I've titled it A Holy Life. And you'll see why I've titled it that way. I as we go throughout this study. But that's going to be the encouragement is that a life worth living is a holy life. And and so we'll go ahead and get into our study. Uh, I want you to remember, we talked about it actually several weeks ago, I think probably before we started doing the live stream, that Jane, or I'm sorry, Ephesians is basically broken up into two sections, right? The first part is very doctrinal. And then the second part of the book is very practical. And you're going to find within this second part of Ephesians, a lot of teaching that, that you can learn and really apply and, and examine yourself and, and see if you're living the type of way that God wants you to live. And, and so as we go throughout this study, we'll see that very thing. We'll see really just, just pinpoints. We'll, we'll see where Paul will say, now you need to be this way and this way and this way. And, and really practical information that you could take and live with and, and examine your life with. But as we get into our study, he starts by saying this, chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. The, the idea behind what he's saying, he, he says no longer, which basically means like you used to live this way. As a matter of fact, he says it's the way the rest of the Gentiles walk. The, the word Gentile comes from a Greek word ethnos, and, and it basically is is a word that just means nations, right? It's the word from which we get our word ethnic. And basically what he's saying here is this, like you used to live the way the rest of the world lived. And, and you don't need to live that way anymore. Don't live like everybody else. Most people in the world are going to live a certain way. And the admonition or the teaching here is that you don't do that. And so he goes on to describe somewhat of what that's like. He says, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. What I want you to notice is that so much about the way people typically live has to do with their mindset has to do with ignorance. It has to do with a misunderstanding of who God is, a misunderstanding of, of morality, of what, what is right and what is wrong. He talks about the futility of their mind. He talks about their understanding being darkened. He talks about ignorance that's in them. And even the phrase blindness of their heart, I think really boils down to the heart being your 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 mindset and, and what, what you're focused on. He talks about blindness of it. Some translations would say hardness of it. It's kind of a hardening of a heart that, that some say they're just set in their ways and, and really can't be budged one way or the, or the other. And, and so they have this understanding that is ignorant. They have this, this misunderstanding of God. Their, their mindset isn't in the right place. And what you'll find is that shows up in the way they live. He says in verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. That phrase past feeling is, is very important. And you'll see that in people's lives where things that should hurt, uh, things that, that should prick us, don't. Uh, scripture often talks about calloused, uh, being calloused or hard-hearted. Uh, I, I like to think of it kind of, you know, 
I used to work a lot more with my hands than I do. I, I used to lift weights and, and even do a lot more manual labor than I do. And, and what would happen is I would get these calluses on my hand. And what a callus does is it basically just hardens that skin to where if you take a needle and, and you stick it in most parts of your body, it hurts. But if you, if you stick it in that callus, you really don't even feel it. And, and it's kind of in that way that some people live their lives. They, they do things that should prick them. They do things that should violate a conscience and, and hurt them but it doesn't even bother them. They, they just live that way and that's kind of who they are. And, and some are even very proud of, of the lives that they live. And, and being that way, they've given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. And so that's kind of the way that people in the world live. That's how the Gentiles walk and the way they used to walk. But what he'll say is that, but you have not so learned Christ, right? That's, that lifestyle is not a life that is learned from Christ. He says, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. See, that's not a, a lifestyle that, that Christ uh, teaches. As a matter of fact, what Christ will teach us is a very different life. The truth that is in Jesus teaches us that to put off, he says, concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Your lusts, he says, are deceitful. There are things that, that, that the old man wanted to do and, and their desires would tell them it was good to do. Their desires would tell them it's the right thing to do. Their desires would tell them that they should continue to do that. Their, their desires would, would at times tell them that those things that are wrong are actually right or the things that are right are wrong and, and their lusts would deceive them. But if you remember back in verse 20, he says the, the truth is in Jesus. So you kind of have Jesus saying one way of life and you're less saying another way of life. One is true and one is deceitful. And, and they used to follow the deceitful. But now the encouragement is to follow the truth that is in Jesus. He says in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And, and so, as we talked about earlier, so much of the problem of the rest of the world, so much of the problem of the Gentiles is their mindset. They, they had under, their understanding darkened. They were ignorant of life. Uh, they, they, their, their understanding was darkened. And all the different things he said, there was a mind problem. Well, the teaching now and what Jesus teaches is to renew your mind basically change the way you think the problem we often face in evangelism is that we we focus on trying to get people to be baptized and then they're baptized and they come up out of the water we say well you can't do this you can't do this you can't do this and you have to do this this and this and and though they wanted their sins washed away they they've never really changed the way they think and and what following christ demands is is a renewed mindset a, a different way of thinking about right and wrong a different way of thinking about life and the purpose of it a different way of thinking about who we are i think it's seen oftentimes in the way we treat scripture almost as if we, we just read it to see what we can get away with we, we almost treat scripture as if like I, 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 if i can't find a verse that doesn't specifically say not to do something then, then, you know, I, I, I could do whatever when in actuality, following Christ isn't just about like what I can do and what I can't do. It's about changing your mind completely and, and living in a way that is like, I just, I just want to follow Christ. I, I just want to be his. I want to be a part of his body. I want to do things that are good for the body. I want to avoid things that are bad for the body. And, and, and just completely and totally dedicating and, and devoting yourself to Christ. And, and that only takes place if, if you renew your mind in the way you think about right and wrong. And, and what you'll find is that, that it, it's like, and he describes it, like you're a completely new person. Verse 24 says, and you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So earlier he said in verse 22, you put off the old man 
And now he says in verse 24, you put on the new man. And so the old person that I was, Jesus says, like, put that person away. That's how you used to live. Like everybody else in the world, you used to live that way. You was ignorant. You used to live that way in, in a darkness of understanding. You used to live that way and in, in, in participated in all the things you participated in. But now you need to put off that man, put on the new man who just thinks differently and, and, and goes about life differently. And it is created, as he says, in righteousness and holiness. I've titled this class a holy life. I really could have titled it a righteous and holy life. But, but what I want you to notice is that this new man who thinks differently is also going to act differently. The way we act is determined by the way we think. And so if we think wrong, we will act wrong. But if we think right, we will act right. And so when our understanding is darkened, when we're ignorant, when we're, we're blinded in heart, our actions are going to be lewd. They're going to be according to greediness and uncleanness, and, and they're just not going to be right. But when our minds are renewed, we become this new person who acts in a holy and in a righteous way. And so the question then becomes, well, what is that holy and righteous way of living? And, and that's where we get to what I was saying earlier about Paul being very specific. And that's one of the things I appreciate that so far about this study is because like we could we could just take what has been said so far in our study and, and almost apply anything we want to it, right? I could say, well, I need to live holy in a righteous life. And then, you know, I, I could kind of come up with whatever I think is holy and righteous, but Paul doesn't allow that. He tells us what a holy and a righteous life is. He goes on, therefore, Right? Because we've renewed our mind, because we're this new person who's created in righteousness and holiness, how is this new person supposed to behave? Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And so the beginning part of this chapter was about oneness, right? He, he gives those, those one, those, I think it's seven ones that he mentions. Uh, there's, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who's above all through all and in you all. And, and in that he says, there's one body, right? That this church that has been described in the book of Ephesians, this body of Christ is described in Ephesians chapter one. There's a oneness and we're members of one another. And, and if we're striving for unity, if we're striving for oneness, then what we'll do is speak the truth. God's people are people of truth. God is a God of truth. He speaks truth. Uh, there's no deceit in him at all. And and God's people should be that way as well. And, and that's what God wants from his people. This new man ought to be a truthful person. And so you can just take that and just kind of apply it to any area of life. You know, it's tax time. Well, are you going to be honest in, in reporting how much you've earned, right? Uh, in your dealings at home with your spouse, are you going to be honest about where you've been? Can you be honest about what you've been doing? Can you be honest about the money you spend in, in your interactions with your children, in your interactions with your friends, in your interactions with your, your bosses or your coworkers? All throughout, like, are you a truthful person? A, a, a new man, as described in this passage, is one who speaks the truth and not lies. He goes on and says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. And so it's not that he's saying don't ever be angry. As a matter of fact, there are times where we should be angry. Uh, all people, it's a human emotion that, that all people go through. But the problem with the Gentiles or the nations, the rest of the world, is that what, what most people do is that they, they get angry about something and they just kind of let it fester. They don't solve the problem. Uh, most people, when they're, when they're angry, don't handle it right. right? They, they, they lash out. Uh, they, they act in 
in mean ways or in unloving ways. And you say, well, why does that person speak so, so meanly to his children or to his spouse? Or why does she speak in the way she does to her husband with such disrespect and rudeness and meanness? Why do they insult each other? Why, why are they? Well, it's because they haven't controlled their anger. It's because they, they have been angry, but instead of solving it in a godly way, they've let it manifest itself in, in sinful behavior. They've given a foothold to Satan. You say, why is that person violent? Why is that person so mean? Why is that person so harsh? It's, it's because they haven't controlled their anger. And what he's saying here is a holy person, a righteous person, this new man who's, who's got a different way of thinking will not only not be somebody who who speaks truth, but he'll be somebody also who controls his anger. It's not that he doesn't get angry, but, but he doesn't allow that to give a, a foothold to Satan or give place to Satan. He says in verse 28, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. And so many in our world are concerned about getting money however they would get money and and then just kind of storing it up right and only using it on themselves it's it's a there's a dishonest way that many gain money uh they they many many of them will gain it by deceit uh many will will take things that don't belong to them and he's saying look you used to be that way right no longer do that you used to be somebody who was only concerned about yourself and you would take what wasn't yours but now it's just this completely new way of thinking. Remember, it's a renewed mind so that not only do you not take the things that don't belong to you, but you work with your hands, not for the purpose of, of storing up things, not for the purpose of making yourself rich, but for the purpose of helping those who are in need. Just a completely different way of thinking, a completely renewed mind. In verse 29, he says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And so this new man speaks differently. Interesting that the way we often think about the language we use is we have kind of these list of words that we say you can't say. But but you'll find that through scripture, he, he Scripture talks about the, the way we speak in a much different way than that. Uh, the words we use show our heart. The words we use show the people we are. And, and as he speaks specifically here, it's about our interaction, uh, interactions with other people. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we focus on this as much as I think that we should, as much as, as I believe Scripture does. Is that what he wants us to do is to use our words for necessary edification. That means edification is necessary. It's, it's important, extremely important that we edify one another, that we may impart what he says, grace or kindness to the hearers. When people hear us, they, they need to be edified. When, when we speak, we should be those who speak with kind words and, and lifting people up. But what so many do is they speak in a much more corrupt way than that. They, they speak words like gossip and, and they speak words that are unkind and they speak words that are vulgar and they, they speak words that tear people down. Uh, they, they complain, they, they bicker, they, they um, backbite. I mean, they, they use their words in ways that are not good for others. And he says, no, that's, that's the behavior of the world, but that should not be the behavior of, of this new man. Uh, this should not be your behavior. He goes on in verse 30 and says this, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I think this language kind of goes back to chapter one and verse 13, where he originally talked about the Holy Spirit of God being God's seal of his promise. It's like when we became Christians, God almost put a stamp on us saying, you know, that's mine. And the Holy Spirit is, is that stamp or that seal saying we belong to God. But what can happen when we act in ways that are, well, like the rest of the world, um, when we walk like the Gentiles walk, 
when we, we live with futility of mind, when our understanding's darkened, when we're ignorant, and when, when we have these blinded hearts and we allow that to, to bring about lewd behavior, when we allow that to bring about corrupt behavior with greediness, when, when we remain like, like everybody else and live in these old lives and, and we lie and we steal and we use language we should not use and, 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 and tear each other down and gossip about each other and complain and we bicker about each other and, and all the thing and we, we, we let our anger give, give place to Satan. What he says is that spirit that God has given as a seal grieves. He hurts and, and, and we grieve God's Holy Spirit when we don't act the way we should, when we walk like the Gentiles and not in, in a holy way or in a righteous way. He goes on and says, and, and again, speaking more about kind of the way we speak, let all bitterness wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. The word bitterness, I think of when you eat something bitter and you just kind of get that sour face and you're like, I don't like that at all. And, and sometimes people treat each other like that. Even the church people could treat each other like that. It's just when, when, when I hear this person's name, it just, just gives me this like nasty, like this bitter feeling. God doesn't want that. Anger and, and wrath. We've already talked about that. How, how we could allow our anger and our wrath to, to cause us to treat people in ungodly ways and, and in mean ways. Clamor is an interesting word. And if you were to look up the way that this word is usually translated, it, it has to do with like a loud crying, right? Almost, almost like a, a, a yelling or a, a screaming. And, and people do that with each other, right? We get mad and, and we don't control ourselves and, and we speak to each other with, with loud screaming type ways. And, and what he's saying is like, like no, you, you got to learn to control yourself better than that. Like you, can, you can have a disagreement with somebody and not scream at them. No one likes that. No one likes to be demeaned like that or belittled like that. And, and, and that's not the behavior that, that the Holy Spirit wants of us. He says, in all evil speaking, uh, put away from you with all malice. This, this idea that's just the opposite of forgiving. Like I'm just mad and angry and I'm bitter towards this person. And so I speak evil of them. I raise my voice at them. And it's just this behavior towards others. And he says, that's got to be put away from you. He says, and verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. It's a different mindset. It's, it's a different attitude. It's a renewed mind. It's, it's, it's a mind that says, you know, I'm not going to treat people with anger and wrath and malice. I'm not going to scream at people. I'm not going to, I'm not going to shout. I'm, I'm not going to, um, to, to, to speak evil of them. I'm, I'm not going to have this mindset of, of, of just unforgiving, but instead I'm, I, I want to be kind. I want to be tender hearted towards people. I want to be forgiving of others. And I want to recognize always that, that I should behave that way ultimately, because that's the way that God in Christ forgave me. That God treated me with a tender heart. He treated me with kindness. He treated me in a forgiving way. And if I'm a child of his, taught by Jesus the Christ and walk in his way as a holy and a righteous person, then that's the way I should treat others also. And so the teaching for today is let us all make sure that we are living a holy life. And, and I hope that, that you are striving always to do that. I want to go ahead and offer a prayer at this time, if, if you'll pray with me. Our dear Father, we are thankful to you for this way that we're able to communicate uh, your word. God, we know that 
we haven't always, our world, been able to uh, reach out to each other in times like this. We haven't always been able to um, sit down in our homes and, and hear people and hear your word taught in other places, and we're thankful for that technology. God, we pray that our study today was in, in accordance with your word. We, we pray that uh, we always strive to know how you want us to behave, to live in a way that pleases you and brings glory to you. God, as we study today, we pray that you'll help us and, and find in us people who live a holy life and a righteous life. Our God, we love you, and it's through your Son that we pray. Amen. As I've typically done at the end of these classes, or at least have started here recently, I want to go ahead and give our phone number for this congregation. Again, if, if you are in need of anything, I, if, if we can help you in your relationship with God, if we can help you get right with God, if, if we could study with you, if, if we can share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we can help you in any way, we, we would love for you to reach out to us and contact us. Uh, we're at the, the office typically Monday through Friday, and so uh, you can give us a call and so someone should be here to answer, and, and we would love to, to be able to help you in any way that we can. Uh, thank you again for listening, and, and I hope you have a wonderful day.